talking this evening about the laws of science. And I think there's some clear implications relating to the creation evolution controversy just from the fact that there are laws that govern the universe. There are laws that we experiment, we see, we experience here in Texas and they operate the same way in China and as far as we can tell throughout the universe. And in what I would consider the golden age of science when Sir Isaac Newton and Kepler and men like this studied and taught science, made incredible discoveries and progress from their day, they considered the laws of science uh, emanating from God that they were thinking God's thoughts after him. That bothers a lot of people today. Of course, there's still a lot of scientists who think exactly that way. But men like James Shea have difficulty with that concept. He's editor of the Journal of Geological Education, and he says the concept is anachronistic. This concept of laws of science, this is old-fashioned. It's uh, belonging to a past era in that it originated at a time when the Almighty was thought to have established the laws of nature and to have decreed that nature must obey them. And then this fellow who's a scientist says it is a great pity for the philosophy of science that the word law was ever introduced. And that just absolutely amazes me that someone considers himself a scientist thinks that way. The truth of the matter is science was born from the concept of believing that there were laws that we could discover. There were laws that had been laid down by a creator that we could repeat and experiment and uh, experiment with and, and come to know from repeated use. Prior to that time, it was all magic and demons and mystery, and you couldn't repeat things, you couldn't explain things. But once they understood that there were laws that governed the universe that we could study and discover and repeat, then we can have science. That's where science came from. But now then he's recalling from that because of the implications. If there is that kind of law of science, maybe there's a lawgiver, and uh, that doesn't fit his philosophy. Albert Einstein would certainly be considered one of the great men of science, and he certainly believed that there were laws, that it wasn't a pity that we thought about it in terms of laws. And he's speaking here about thermodynamics, and we'll talk some about that this evening. Don't let the word uh, scare you. This is a concept that I assure you you understand, though you may not use that terminology. And he says, this is the only physical theory of universal content concerning which I am convinced that within the framework of the applicability of its concepts, it will never be overthrown. Here are laws that we can depend on. Now, we talked about what it took last night to become a law and to be proved scientifically. This fits all of those criteria perfectly. There are a number of laws of thermodynamics. The first one we'll look at basically says you can't create something from nothing. You didn't know that, did you? Just out of nothing, you don't get anything, do you? It's sometimes called the law of conservation. Matter, energy can be interchanged, but neither can be created or ultimately destroyed. You burn something up, but it just changes its form to vapor and smoke and so forth. Isaac Isomoff is an atheist, recently deceased. Someone said he's probably written more books than he's read. I think that's an overstatement. Over 600 books, uh, science fiction as well as mainline science, but one of the, the leaders in the field, and he's speaking about this concept and says, the law is considered the most powerful, most fundamental generalization about the universe that scientists have ever been able to make. This is the one that we have more confidence in. He says, this law is, is, uh, is one that no one knows why um, and it, it is a mystery, and it's interesting to talk to scientists uh, when they begin to speculate about why energy is conserved, and they can't break this law. Uh, but 
he says, uh, no one knows why it's conserved. All that anyone can say is that in over a century and a quarter of careful measurement, scientists have never been able to point to a definite violation of energy conservation. Now that's, again, what it takes to become a law. This is true either in the familiar everyday surroundings about us or in the heavens above or in the atoms within. Now that's a very broad scope and sometimes people will say, well, yes, but it doesn't apply to atoms or it doesn't apply to the heavens and even the atheist acknowledges that it certainly does. You can't get something out of nothing. Well, how did we get something? The present concepts of naturalism say that all things came into existence out of present laws, but this most powerful generalization about the universe says you can't get anything out of nothing, and we know from the second law that it's not eternal, it all degenerates. This is the principle of uniformity. We explain everything in terms of what we see now, and yet how can you do that? That, of course, is a theory. We don't know that from a fact. And Isomov is wrestling with this conflict. How do you explain what we have, which we know can't be eternal, when you can't get something from nothing if you don't have the supernatural? Natural law says that won't work. Well, he's wrestling with that when he says, perhaps in an infinite sea of nothingness, if you can imagine that. It sounds like there's something, doesn't it? Globs of positive and negative energy in equal size pairs are constantly forming. I, I think he's already gotten off track from his nothingness there. After passing through evolutionary changes, combining once more and vanishing. And we are in one of these blobs in the period of time between nothing and nothing and wondering about it. And this is supposed to be science when the most fundamental generalization about the universe is that you cannot do that. And so here we have this principle of uniformity, which he's trying to sustain, that says everything came into existence as a result of present laws, and then that fundamental generalization that says you can't do it, the principle of conservation. The second law is just as much actually more confrontational to the concepts of natural origins and the second law basically says things go downhill. You didn't know that either, did you? We all understand that very well. It's called the principle of entropy increase. And scientists like to say things uh, just to make you work at it a little bit. It, entropy is the measure of disorder. And so uh, it says basically the system runs down or wears out and tends toward disorganization, which we all understand. Entropy is the measure of that disorder. And so the disorder increases. That's <laughs> it's a backwards way to look at it, but that's the concept. Isomov again is describing this when he says another way of stating the second law then is the universe is constantly getting more disorderly. Viewed that way, we can see the second law all about us. We have to work hard to straighten a room. Left to itself, it becomes a mess again very quickly, very easily. Even if we never enter it, it becomes dusty and musty, and how difficult to maintain our houses and machinery and our own bodies in working order, and how easy to let them deteriorate. Is this news to anybody? No. We don't call it the second law, usually, of thermodynamics, but what we do when we think of it in that context and we measure it precisely is prove that there are no exceptions to this that this is always the way it works. He continues describing it, saying, in fact, all we have to do is nothing, and everything deteriorates, collapses, breaks down, wears out all by itself, and this is what the second law is all about. We buy a new house, and over the years it gets brighter and shinier and uh, <laughs> adds new rooms and gets more ordered. No, it goes the other way, doesn't it? and sometimes winds up looking like this. This is, this is what we observe if we watch long enough, isn't it? But the concept of natural origin says it's going the other way. It's defined, evolution by Dobjonsky, as a directional process that gives rise to increase, precisely the opposite. 
In the book Cosmic Evolution, notice the subtitle, The Rise of Complexity in Nature. This is the naturalist description of what's going on. Eric Chison of Harvard is quoted here on the book cover. Along an era of time starting at the Big Bang, Chison depicts cosmic evolution in a wide range of systems, particulate, galactic, stellar, planetary, chemical, biological, cultural. Over time, all these systems, be they manifest in worms, human brains, or microchips, become both more complex and more ordered. Everything in the universe is going uphill. But the second law that we observe and have tested and have proven says it goes the other way. And so we have the theory which says it goes uphill, and we have the law that says it goes downhill, and they're very much in conflict with each other, and which one ought to prevail? I think that's a fairly easy question, unless you have philosophy dominating your science. Well, when we present this, there's an obvious problem uh, that people see, but there's an answer that we inevitably get on the college campuses that is supposed to answer this dilemma. And that is that the earth is open to the energy of the sun. And we have all of this energy bathing the earth. And with that extra energy, you can overpower this tendency to degeneration. And of course, you can make things go uphill. You can make water run uphill with a pump, engineer, energy. Uh, you can have the acorn that grows up to the oak tree. Of course, it eventually dies and deteriorates, but it is bathed in the energy of the sun, and you can see that overpowering the tendency to degeneration. And so the idea is that as long as you have energy, then you just forget the law. <laughs> Actually, there's some that think that and have taught that. In, it's, it's nonsense. John Ross of Harvard uh, in Chemical Engineering News addressed that point directly when he says, ordinarily the second law is stated for isolated systems. That's the way it's defined. That's the way you have to make the equations balance. You have to deal with it in terms of the closed system. Something else is going to mess up the equation. But the second law applies equally well to open, open systems. I mean, the fact you've got the sun shining on you doesn't mean you're not going to get old and deteriorate, does it? Uh, or is that uh, we know that's not the case with buildings. Arnold Summerfield, who wrote the book Thermodynamics and Statistical Mechanics, says the quantity of entropy generated locally cannot be negative, irrespective of whether the system is isolated or not. Entropy, the measure of disorder, has to be positive. Disorder increases, again, that backwards approach. George Gaylord Simpson of Harvard it makes, I think, a very common sense statement in his introduction to biology when he says, the simple expenditure of energy is not sufficient to develop and maintain order. Now, if you're going to develop and maintain order, make something go uphill, yes, you have to have energy, but that's a necessary requirement, not a sufficient requirement, though. You have to have more than that. He says, a bull in a china shop performs work but he neither creates nor maintains organization. Does that make sense? <laughs> the work needed is particular work. It must follow specifications. It requires information on how to proceed. And so not only do you need energy in order to overpower this deterioration, you need information. You need particular energy specifying how things proceed. And that's very obvious when you look at the simple cell. And that's what we're talking about in terms of origins here. Carl Sagan, uh, certainly not a friend of the creationist, acknowledges that the information content of the simple cell has been estimated at around 10 to the 12th bits. How much is that? Comparable to about 100 million pages of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now that's a lot of information. Where did it come from? It didn't come from the energy of the sun shining down on the earth. That doesn't produce 100 million pages of information. 
information itself, like physical systems, deteriorate and go downhill. And every exchange that we know anything about is going downhill with extra information that you add to the system together with energy you can make it go up but you can't make it go up if you don't have both energy and information we can illustrate that for example with mutations which ironically is supposed to be the raw material for the upward process of evolution but actually it's a degeneration of the information as the cell replicates something gets messed up and all of this hundred million pages worth of information in the simple cell, something in there is not replicated perfectly and something goes wrong. One illustration of that is the Texas blind salamander. Now it doesn't hurt it that bad since it can't see anyway down in the cave to have lost its eyes. But this mutation is not really an upward process, is it? It's downhill, it's losing information. I was testifying before the textbook committee in Austin. Uh, a couple of years ago, along with Dr. Bishop, who was head of the biology department, University of Texas, and the two of us were speaking to the school board, and one of the school board members asked Dr. Bishop, is there an example of evolution that we can see in the world today? You say, this is proved, it's a fact, we ought to be able to see it. And he said, well, yes, the, the blind salamander in Texas said, Dr. Patton, what do you have to say about that? I said, well, it's, yes, it's changed, but it's lost its eyes. There's a tremendous amount of genetic information in an eye, and he lost it. This, <laughs> this is downhill, not uphill. Now, if he comes up with headlights down there, then he's evolving. <laughs> and so one of the school board members said, well, Dr. Bishop, can you think of a better example than that salamander that went blind? <laughs> and he got mad and got up and left. But all of the changes that they point to are like this, degenerative. De and and they, they say, well, look, he's he adapted. Well, yeah, but it's a downhill process. Mutations decrease information. Richard Dawkins was presented with this dilemma uh, recently, and he was asked, can you think of any kind of a change that is not a decrease in information? Illustration of this second law. And, and it was focused on information. Would you like to know what he said? Give me an example of an increase, uh, uh, any kind of a mutation or evolutionary change that increases information. But I'd like for you, instead of me just telling you what he said, let me let you listen. And we'll listen to the interviewer asking him the question. Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome. There's a popular misunderstanding of evolution which says that uh, fish turned into reptiles and reptiles turned into mammals and, and so somehow we ought to be able to look around the world today and look, and look at our ancestors. We ought to be able to to see the intermediates between fish and reptiles or between reptiles and mammals. We ought to be able to see fish kind of on the way to becoming reptiles. But of course that's not the way it is at all. Fish are modern animals. They're just as modern as we are. They're descended from ancestors, which we're descended from. Way back 300 million years ago there would have been an ancestor, which was the ancestor of modern fish and the ancestor of, uh, of modern, modern humans. And that ancestor, if you could have been there then, you could have seen the first steps towards a fish, uh, say, coming out onto the, onto the land and, be, and becoming, um, becoming a, something like an amphibian. But that was a long time ago. You wouldn't expect to see that today. Isn't that brilliant? <laughs> I mean, you really got a good example of something that uh, increases information. Uh, I guarantee you he wishes he had a better answer, but that's the best he can do. He's, of course, had a lot to do with, along with Carl Sagan, the SETI program here in the United States, which I think very well illustrates the problem. Billions of dollars being spent looking up into the sky for what? 
some kind of information, some kind of a dot, dot, dash, dash that would indicate there's intelligence out there. And if we saw this information, that would indicate intelligence in outer space. We haven't found it. <laughs> Still trying. But why don't instead we just look down the microscope, as many have, and recognize what's there? As uh, he tells us, Sagan tells us, there's a hundred million pages of the Encyclopedia Britannica. That's a whole lot more than just a few dots and dashes. If you walk along the beach, as we pointed out, and you see John loves Mary, that's enough information to say this is from intelligence, but they see a hundred million pages of information, and no, that, that just happened. That's not intelligence. But if we saw a few dots and dashes, that'd prove intelligent life in outer space. Does that make sense to you? It just shows the power of the prejudice against uh, something besides natural origins. So when we talk about this degenerative law, the second law of thermodynamics that pervades the universe, the simple explanation, well, it's open to energy of the sun, provides a necessary requirement to overcome the degenerative process, but it's not sufficient. You also need information. And in that simplest cell, you need an explanation for a hundred million pages worth of information. In the simplest cell, we know anything about. Okay, you got part of the answer, the energy. Where is the other part of the answer? Where did the information come from? And I've asked that question on college campuses all over the country over and over again. And you know what they say? You just heard the answer. <laughs> they don't have one. Oh, we got energy from the sun, yes, but that's not really the answer, is it? That won't do the trick. Not only do we see this in the world around us, I think we see evidence of this degenerative process everywhere we look. One place the evolutionist wouldn't expect to see it is in the life of the past, and we'll talk more about that when we speak of the fossil record Friday evening. But it is a degenerative process, and while we have all of these little books that show upward increase of the animals and the little horse charts and the graduated man charts, that's not what you see in the fossil record. Even Stephen Gould acknowledges this when he says the sweep of anatomical diversity, all the different forms of anatomy, how, much, how many, well you, you've got a maximum right after the initial diversification of multicellular animals. In other words, when it starts, that's the way it is. It's more diverse than it is now. The later history of life preceded by elimination, not expansion. It's going downhill. And it was larger in the past, and we have degenerated. Now, you've read that in your textbook, right? Don't think so. But this textbook acknowledges uh, in this geology text that mammalian life was richer in kinds of larger sizes and had a more abundant expression in the Pliocene than in later times, and you can find expressions like that in all of the periods. Let's just look at a few examples that would help demonstrate this point, beginning with uh, Louis Leakey, who's supposed to be one of the icons of evolution. If you saw Gorillas in the Mist, he's the, the hero of evolution, who really wasn't, and we'll talk more about that later. But Time Magazine, a number of years ago, says he was scouring the gourd since 1931. Over the years, he's unearthed the bones of an ancient pig as big as a rhino. Y'all have all seen pigs like that? A six-foot-tall sheep, flat-top skull of a wrecked nutcracker man. I think that was a big ape. A uh, pig as big as a rhino. Or you could make a killing in the bacon business, could this is a picture of one of those pigs from the Dakota School of Mines. The one on the right <laughs> is the fossil pig. And if pigs were this big, how big were the rhinos? Here's one from India, 20 feet tall. Back to Lewis Leakey's finds, illustrated here in Time magazine, we see the fossil ram that was found there in Africa, compared with a modern ram in the background. 
You can see what's happening here. It's going downhill, isn't it? But, of course, man has gotten larger over the years, and we know in the last 50 years that there has been a pretty dramatic increase. Most biologists would say this is because of our knowledge of nutrition and vitamins. Uh, we have more to eat and better food to eat. It's not the kind of change that they're looking for to explain evolution. If there, there's been about a six-inch increase on average in the past, uh, well, less than 100 years, actually. But if you increase six inches in 100 years and 200 years a foot, uh, and in 400 years, two feet, and, uh, you know, a couple of thousand years ago, we were below zero. <laughs> this is much too fast and not the kind of thing they're looking for. Plus, when we look at the fossil record, we see evidence of large people, which they don't always tell you about. This is Turconoboy, found by Lewis's son, Richard. He was 5'6", but the interesting thing is he was nine years old. If they can tell from the teeth. We probably have some nine-year-olds here, but I strongly suspect they're not five six. We have, well, Cro-Magnon man averaged six six in height. Uh, several uh, two fossils in Italy found a couple of years ago over eight feet. They were big in the past. Not all, but many of them were. We excavated this donkey from near Lubbock, Texas, several years ago, nine feet tall at the shoulder. That kind of messes up the little horse charts, doesn't it? <laughs> That's not going to work too well, but so they leave him out. In the same area, we excavated a bison with a 12-foot horn span that stood about 11 feet tall at the hump. Y'all have all seen bisons that tall? No. But that's the way it was in the fossil record. And we see the little armadillos running around. You can see the normal size one in the foreground here in this page from a geology textbook. But notice the, uh, the writing at the bottom. This was nine times larger than present-day armadillos. Now, when you see these little graduated horse charts and you see the graduated man chart <laughs> that is supposed to give the illusion everything's getting bigger, uh, let me tell you something, you're being lied to because every paleontologist knows the very opposite is true. Uh, just a few years ago at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, which uh, I'll be at next week down in Houston, by the way, their annual meeting, they were talking about an armadillo that they found. It was the size of an elephant. That's the way it was described. In fact, in 2004, this news release came from the BBC. Here's a Stone Age elephant twice. Now, elephants are big today. But here were elephants twice as big as the largest modern African elephant. Bones of other large animals, rhinoceros, all of them were bigger. And here we see at the inset the huge tusk for these elephants that were twice as large as modern-day elephants. We're looking here at a fossil turtle that looks for all the world like modern turtles, except this one was 14 feet from one side to the other. You see many 14-foot turtles running around. Here compared with a 7-foot basketball player, he uh, is dwarfed. From down Big Ben, and it's not because it's from Texas, but there is a, a big crocodile compared with a modern crocodile here, 50 to 20 feet. National Geographic had a special that dealt with the large crocodiles that were seen in the fossil record just a couple of years ago. And this is typical when you look at the fossil record. We're looking here in the center at a 14-foot shark jaw. That's a good-sized shark, but wow, look at that thing from the fossil record. Jaws is dwarfed by such. We see the great white illustrated. That's a pretty good-sized shark but nothing like the fossil sharks. We have one of the teeth from the large fossil shark back in our artifact room. Most of us are familiar with our little beavers. Uh, they can be uh, pretty uh, aggravating as they go around chewing on branches, but think how aggravating it would be if they were 10 feet long 
as is the case in the fossil record. Again, a page from a geology textbook. Here we see a picture from the uh, Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago of the 10-foot beaver. Science reported just a few years ago a real mighty mouse, <laughs> 8 million years ago, the buffalo-sized rodents roamed in Venezuela. In fact, Science News reported him as Ratzilla. <laughs> Glad they're not around. <laughs> this from 2005 in Syria, a camel foot that indicated a camel, according to the BBC, double the size. Do you get the point? I mean, this just goes on and on and on. This is the way it was. One of my favorites here described in Wikipedia is the demon duck of doom. Eight feet tall, 500 pounds, carnivorous. Don't want one of those things after you. Uh, kind of reminiscent of a, a movie scene. <laughs> Here. <laughs> that, that, that would alarm us, I think. <laughs> From Australia, killer kangaroos once roamed Australia. Science News says they had teeth that crunched through bones, sliced off flesh. They were enormous. Why haven't you been told this in your textbooks? Because it doesn't look like evolution, does it? It looks like devolution, <laughs> devolving, and so they don't tell you about it. The ground sloths we have today, five or six feet long, but 20 feet long, and this is what the textbook says. I've seen them twice that size. This one is from the Price Museum of Natural History in Utah. I measured the hand portion. It was 18 inches. They just found one down in uh, Argentina. The hand was twice that size, which would indicate someone twice as big as this one. One of the more common fossils, especially with dinosaurs, is the cattails. We see those in Texas quite often. How tall are cattails? You might see them in Texas, pretty good size, eight, maybe 10 feet. 120 feet tall is not unusual in the fossil record. You can see the little man for scale here. Uh, you don't see that today, but it's typical in the fossil record. We're looking here at a modern cycad, a type of fern here in the Dakota School of Mines. I put the quarter up here for scale. This is their sign. But we look in the fossil record and hear from the book Fossil Cycads. True cycads were apparently quite large. One fossil from Japan is a stem over four feet in diameter. Today it's like a little you know, maximum 18-inch fern. Bugs were big. <laughs> All the bugs were big. Most of them are found in the Pennsylvania, and I think that's because it's not a time era. It is a swamp area where you find a lot of bugs. But notice, <laughs> not a few of them, not some of them, all of them. This is uh, a beautiful fossil of a dragonfly, 27 inches in wingspan. Do you get the point? Just on and on and on. We excavate, I excavated a, a cockroach from near Oblong, Illinois, uh, several years ago, a foot and a half long. The wife wouldn't let me bring it in the house. You know, it, it, it's a rock, no, it's a cockroach. <laughs> when we look back in the fossil record, obviously we see big things when we look at dinosaurs, and these were enormous. Here's Seismosaurus, maybe 150 feet long. There are, well, there is one representative of the beakneck family that's still around that remains from this group of animals, maybe killed off by people that <laughs> uh, understood what we see when we look at Jurassic Park. We'd rather not have those things around. The only representative today is the Tuatara from New Zealand, same family. He's about eight inches long. Hadn't evolved a whole lot. What we see in this whole world around us is not an upward process, but a downhill process everywhere, even in the fossil record. Now, 
animals going downhill. Is that because of the second law of thermodynamics? I'm not sure I can prove that, but it sure smells like it. <laughs> Everything else is going downhill, and we certainly see that indicated in the fossil record. Uh, at least it gives me a chance to combat the picture, the lie that's presented with these little graduated horse charts, leaving out my nine-foot donkey, and the graduated man chart, leaving out the Turkana boy, and all of the fossils that are inevitably bigger in the past. It's all going downhill. I think it fits a consistent picture. 